Hello, everyone. Welcome to our spring 2024 supply chain and business analytics distinguished speaker series. I am Renu Ramanarayan. I'm a faculty member in the Computing and Decision Sciences Department at the Stillman School of Business, where our business analytics and supply chain programs are housed. I'm also the co-director of the Master of Science in Business Analytics program. This evening, we're delighted to host Dr. Evren Ozkaya from Supply Chain Wizard. I've known Evren for a very long time, and he's always been so kind enough to come and talk to us anytime I ask him. Dr. Ozkaya is the founder and CEO of Supply Chain Wizard and SCW AI, a management consulting and digital solutions firm helping clients establish and execute cost-effective and scalable digital transformation programs via data-driven decisions, decision-making by leveraging state-of-the-art technologies. As a former consultant at McKinsey and & Company and a supply chain executive at Sandoz Novartis, Dr. Ozkaya has held, led various business transformation programs in industries such as pharmaceuticals, healthcare, consumer goods, logistics, and private equity. Advising over 100 plus companies and organization, Evren is a free, frequent keynote speaker at conferences and is an author in leading industry journals. Evren received his PhD in industrial and systems engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology with his award-winning thesis on demand management in global supply chains. He has been selected to the inaugural list of 40 under 40 by Georgia Tech Alumni Association in the class of 2020. Great. He's an advisory board member in the Rutgers Business School, Georgia Tech Industrial and Systems Engineering, Middlesex County College, and Bilkent University, and is involved in part-time teaching in the executive education program at INSET. I am also thrilled to announce he has agreed to join our Masters in Business Analytics Distinguished Advisory Board. <laughs> this evening, Evren will talk about the pharma industry's transformation journey over the last 10 years, driven by traceability and supply chain security regulations for improved patient safety. He will discuss case studies, learnings, pitfalls, and success stories from supply chain wizards experience with over 100 clients in one of the least digitized of all manufacturing industries. That is surprising, isn't it? With the backdrop of an industry transformation journey, everyone will also discuss his own journey of entrepreneurship in the digital age, including personal stories as a road warrior and consultant. Before I hand it over to Evren, just a few housekeeping things. This presentation is being recorded. For the in-person audience, you have mics on your desks, the little black, black box. Please make sure right now the light is on red. During the Q&A session, feel free to ask questions. Press the button on the mic and wait for the light to turn green before you ask the question. Turn it back to red after you ask the question. For the remote audience, please keep your mics muted. We welcome your input and questions, but please drop them in chat and we'll try to make sure we address most of them. With that said, let's give Evren a warm Seton Hall welcome. So Evren, all yours. Thank you very much for the kind intro. This is the most embarrassing part of the entire thing. You know? Getting standing there and getting introduced, um, but I appreciate uh, this is the I don't know like fourth time maybe I'm coming over the last ten years. The last time I was like five years ago, so uh, I you know, see like most of your college students. Is that correct? Can I see all the hands with all the college students? Okay, majority. Uh, what about masters or PhD? Any graduate students? Two, three. Okay, so. Basically, five years ago, you were in high, you were in all in high school, and 
you were in here. So some of the slides, if I repeat, nobody knows, nobody remembers. So that's great. So, uh, you know, really pleasure to be here. I do try to, you know, support universities and, uh, you know, tell a little bit about myself, my company, our journey about digitalization, because I think, you know, most of the things that I learned in the last 10 years, I haven't learned in school. Right. And a lot of things I had to learn myself or with client work and definitely most of the technology topics. I didn't know it, it existed when I was going through like your years, roughly 20 years ago. Um, but let's get started with introduction. So my name is Evren and I love supply chain. If you want to know me, who what is everyone known for? I love supply chain. I also love digital. So if there are two things that you need to say about like what is everyone who is who is he? He's like supply chain guy, he's a digital guy. And the topic today we I also will add uh, at the end is also love entrepreneurship. And this is me inside after 10 years of entrepreneurship. I'm ready to retire. So joke aside. You know, I think one thing that I learned that really brings some level of success is being known for something. Right. What are you known for? What will you want to be known for when you're in your fifth year in your career after college, when you're in 10, 10 years after college, 15, 20 years after college? Most of the opportunities in the last 10 years as an entrepreneur came to me because some people know that like, OK, he's a supply chain guy or he's a supply chain wizard. Sometimes they joke like, hey, is this your title or is this your company? I said it's both supply chain wizard. So I wanted to make a, a name for myself and I wanted to be known for something. So that's why every time I spend enough time and effort in something, I try to make sure that I reorient it as like, how, I, how do I want to be known for? I want to be known for as the digital supply chain guy. And I've been giving a lot of talks uh, about the topic. So today I know we have one hour. But unless someone stops me, I can continue for like hours on the on these topics. I love these topics. Uh, I will prioritize the digital supply chain first, right? But for those of you who might be interested about entrepreneurship and starting your own companies, maybe one day, I will also have some slides about the learnings that I had over the last 10 years or actually the last 20 years, you know, starting from my college years, like you know, where you are right now. So uh, these are two distinct topics, but I try to combine them. Uh, depending on the interest, we can go deeper. I can stay a little longer. I came here, um, you know, uh, without any like hard stop. So, you know, you can keep me as long as you need and happy to be helpful for all of you. So who wants to start uh, their own company one day? Like don't show just one finger, like show your hand, like be okay. One, two, three, maybe. OK, so we'll keep the digital supply chain topic the main topic. Entrepreneurs, like the three of you can come and, and meet with me afterwards. Um, so Supply Chain Wizard is a 10 year old company. Uh, we are a management consulting company focused in supply chain uh, and life sciences. So what are we known for as a company? Life sciences industry, supply chain management and digital transformation. And over the years, we added different service lines to our company. Like we start with traceability, track and trace, visibility in the supply chain, and then digital supply chain consulting services, digital factory consulting services, and then process excellence or process automation. So these are the four key areas that we, we focus on. And over the last few years, I was really glad to, to lead the company to a, a, an incredible amount of growth. So today we are about 80 people globally. Um, and the early days, it was a rocket ship with the consulting you know, team growing. And we made it uh, twice in the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies. New Jersey Fast 50, which includes private and public companies uh, in the state of New Jersey. And then uh, you know, Gartner along the way selected us as a cool vendor, which was super cool. And uh, the, the experience is really about manufacturing companies in pharma. So, 70, 80 percent of our experience came from pharmaceutical manufacturing companies of all sizes. So some of them you probably would know, right? Because you all got shots, right? Last few years ago, everyone knows Pfizer, you know Johnson and Johnson, you know, uh, you know, companies who make these, you know, vaccines. And we also did serve some of the non-pharma companies as well: electronics, you know, ad advanced electronics, you know, cosmetics, you know, food and beverage, etc. 
So had over 100 clients in the last 10 years and over 300 projects. So I can say, you know, I was a, a road warrior because like we did 300 projects over 40 countries, uh, but I also did continue traveling for you know business and pleasure. And then a year ago, something amazing happened. Uh, we decided to separate our company's technology business, which we called Supply Chain Wizard AI, SCW AI. And now we have two companies, the consulting company and the software company. And software company about 15 months ago got uh, a Series A funding, which is important because only about 1% of startups get a Series A funding. Uh, and then about 10% of companies who got Series A will go to the Series B, C, and D, the other, other round. So it's a very tough environment to be in, 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 a, in a startup. But the, the focus area that we picked for ourselves is like digitizing factories. I want to digitize everything, but then I realize that I don't have enough resources. So I just decided, let's start with the factories, and then we'll go, go from there. So that's in a nutshell. I don't want to take too long and talk about you know, supply chain wizard and what we do. This is just to set some background. Uh, before supply chain wizard, I was a, a pharma executive at uh, Novartis. Uh, you probably heard of this name, or Sandoz, the generic arm of Novartis, which is now a brand new company, standalone company. And before Sandoz, as a strategic director for supply chain, I was a consultant at McKinsey and Company. So I'm sure everybody heard about McKinsey. These guys have started the consulting business in 1926. So they started the whole category of management consulting. So who wants to be a consultant? Let me ask that. I only got three people who, who have, OK, more people who wants to be a consultant. Five, six, maybe. Are you interviewing? Got jobs aligned? No? OK, so that's other thing that I do. Uh, happy to help. I was in the, the coaching uh, team at McKinsey, like helping you know, people learn how to get ready for the, the case interviews and, and whatnot. So happy to be helpful in, in any way. So, so that's my background. I always consider myself a supply chain guy. The moment I heard the supply chain in college, I said, that's it. I want to be a supply chain manager. Why? Because it was a global role. If you ever be a supply chain manager in a global company, that means you can travel the world, you can be you know, uh, in charge of different countries, demand and supply, which, by the way, the hardest job in the world. How do you balance demand and supply? Nobody knows. That's why we, gave, we have jobs. That's why we have technologies. Nobody figured it out. Nobody will figure it out entirely. So we are going to continue struggling, but maybe struggle a little bit less with the invention of all these technologies and digital. So, what I want to start with is a story about our last 10 years, the pharmaceutical industry. So I saw this gra uh, graph a few years ago. It still is true, by the way, another McKinsey uh, paper. It ranks the digitalization level of their different industries. And guess where pharma sits? Just ahead of public sector. The pharmaceutical, they say, and I've seen, seen this in, a, in um, other conferences, one of the, the AWS, Amazon Web Services experts, in healthcare was talking about this. It's a joke about if you invent a time machine and if you go to 1950s and 60s and get a pharmaceutical operator from the factory floor, bring it to today and put in a pharmaceutical plant, he or she will know how to do the job. Nothing much changed. The same equipment, same statement, uh, uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, like everything is on paper. So you literally know what to do for the like, like 50, 60, 70 years. So that's why we are the least digitized industry. So why, why is that? Anybody guess? Why pharma? Like, do, they, do they hate technology? Confidentiality? Not so. I actually have listed the answers over there. <laughs> Regulations. When you regulate it, it's hard to change, right? Why change something if you're compliant with the regulation and you know FDA comes in next time you're still compliant, but everything is on paper. What is another another reason why pharma is like not very digital, not very efficient? Yeah, I mean you can say that like lives are at stake. It's not like you're not making widgets or iPhones. You know, if your iPhone doesn't work for a while, that's fine. But if the, the pill that you swallow you know kills you then that's a problem, right? So like very hesitant to change because like the things that we do is like people, you know, put in their bodies. Uh, but then more importantly, from a financial perspective, pharma historically had a very high margin. When you're making a lot of money, 
let's say 90% margin, would you care how much you spend on manufacturing cost and supply chain cost? If your manufacturing supply chain cost double, what would you do? We'll make $85 every, for every $100. That's the branded pharma. Like the, the brand new drugs, the blockbuster drugs, the new innovations that you know, comes to market. But then historically that high margins are no longer holding. The pharma industry is like squeezed on both ends. Sometimes the prices are going down for the generics industry. The costs are going up. So what do you do? You don't make enough money. Now you need to change. Now there is the, the story of change is coming to pharma. Uh, but the, so far, all these years, slow supply chains, very expensive products, complex, you know, flows. So it, it was historically a very difficult industry to be in. Then something happened about 10 years ago. President Obama signed a law. It's called Drug Supply Chain Security Act and required every pharma company, every pharma manufacturer selling into the United States to comply with this regulation, which basically is, means track and trace. You need to track every product in the supply chain so that it is, it's a safe product. Nothing is counterfeit. Everything needs to be tracked. So that regulation literally rallied, and the US was one of the countries of the, the, uh, the leading world, right? Uh, I think 19 out of the G20 countries have now a regulation for track and trace, which means you need to put a lot of systems and hardware and software into pharma supply chain to comply with this regulation. There are two things the company typically focuses on. Regulation, being compliant so that you can sell your products, and then being efficient. For pharma, being compliant came first. That derived the change. Being efficient came second or last. So now it's changing. That's the story of the pharma industry. Why it's changing? Because companies comply with this regulation, they realize their efficiency keeps going down by complying to this regulation. They put new equipment on the packaging lines, more, more failures, more rejects, more cost, which means that they're losing additional efficiency, which their efficiency was very low to begin with. Can anyone guess what is the efficiency level of, level of a consumer goods company, like Procter & Gamble, for example? What's their target efficiency of the plant? Like what percent of the time they're running the plant productively? Any guess? 50%. That's low for CPG. More than 75. 88% is their target OEE figure, the KPI. Like if they're stopping more than 12% of the time, it's a, it's a concern. Anybody can guess pharma industry's average OEE, average efficiency effectiveness. Thirty-five percent. I have been to plants that have five percent efficiency. Five percent, and it's a brand new plant, brand new equipment. They they invested two hundred and fifty million dollars. They're running it for five percent of the time. That's the difference between CPG and pharma. In pharma, you go in, you look at the manufacturing area, you don't hear anything, you don't see anything because nothing is working. You go to CPG, the, the machines are humming. They're like twenty-four-seven dedicated product. In pharma, there are tons of different products. You need to keep changing over different things, lose efficiency, stop, clean. There are cleanup procedures in pharma that's like 18 hours, 25 hours, 36 hours. Five different shifts come and go, they're still cleaning. Why? You don't want to you know, have a drug. You know, like, you know those signs that says like it might include some peanuts and residuals, like be careful, like the same equipment is used in food. But yeah, if there's a little bit of residue of peanut, who cares? unless you have a big allergy, of course. But if you have a, a little bit of a residue of a cancer drug in your you know, painkiller, you would care big time, right? So it's a totally different industry, but it, it created a, an environment where it's very complex, but then the whole industry started investing. Now digital became a hot topic. So, but where are we going with the pharma, the future of pharma, the next 10 years? Have you ever heard of a, a term called industry 4.0? Yeah? The fourth industrial revolution is another name for it. The, the, the age of data, the age of digital. In the pharma industry, they call it pharma 4.0. Pharma companies, they feel special. All my clients, they are special, but they feel extra special. When I came to my first job after McKinsey in pharma, my, my uh, manager, the head of supply chain, 
you know, explained to me that everyone, we are not making widgets. Our products are so important, they save lives, which I totally agree. And then they expire, he said. Before coming to pharma, I worked at McKinsey in like seven, eight different industries. And I just start thinking, well, grocery supply chain seems tough to me as well. It expires in like a few days. The drugs expire in one year or two years, like, and then, you know, pharma companies think they're special, but there are a lot of learnings from other industries, right? Just because you feel like you're making a very important product doesn't necessarily, you know, give you the right to just sit on your butt and not change and not catch the, you know, where the world is going. So therefore, staying in pharma after 10 those Novartis years and serving pharmaceutical industry was the best decision ever because such a uh, high level of uh, improvement opportunities everywhere. So what is, what is going to happen in pharma in the next five, 10 years? You live in New Jersey, you're all looking for jobs, likelihood that like 20 to 30% of you will land a pharma job at some point in your career. So listen carefully. I ran out of uh, you know, animal icons in PowerPoint trying to build this slide. Agility. This is pharma. This is what it needs to be. This is where it's going. Instead of planning in months or quarters, they're now moving into hours and minutes. So we need to keep changing. We need to keep adapting to the change. Productivity. Everybody knows the story, right? The end keeps fall, you know, uh, the ESOP, uh, you know, stories. The efficiency is 35%. They're shooting for the you know, top quartile 65%. Minimizing the downtimes. Connectivity. So every company, typically they, they care about themselves. Hey, it's my supply chain, my manufacturing plant. I ignore my suppliers, I ignore my customers. I try to optimize myself. What CPG, consumer goods industry figured out is you cannot be successful without your suppliers. Retailers figured out, Walmart and Target figured out that you cannot be successful if you don't collaborate really closely with your suppliers. They start sharing data with each other. They start getting connected with each other. They start sharing point of sales data so the manufacturers can decide how much inventory to produce and where to send. So they optimize the shelf stocks. When you go to Walmart, the likelihood is that you find the stuff that you're looking for 99.9% .9 of the time. Except during the pandemic, you might not find what you're looking for. But you know, that's what, well, how do you think that is possible? It's a very complex thing to do. They share data, they share, like they collaborate with their network and the suppliers. So having a unified data structure, understanding how to share data is a key, uh, you know, value driver. And it's going to come to pharma industry as well. I, I heard this last, the next one uh, from Microsoft executive, kill the paper. You wouldn't believe some pharma companies today are sending their purchase orders or sending their requests for orders with fax machines. Anyone knows what a fax machine is? If you're in college in the year 2024, likely within the, you were born in the 2000s, right? Like I didn't use fax machine, barely used it, and I couldn't find one, and then I found online versions of fax. So there are emails, email is a good technology in pharma. Excel is an advanced technology, Excel spreadsheet. If you know Excel, you're like a, a supply chain guru or a wizard. Before I became supply chain wizard, I was an Excel wizard. I could make Excel sing and dance and write macros. It, it helps, but it's not the best way. Kill the paper, transform in a way, which is another you know, nice transformation analogy here, the, you know, the butterfly. Once you're a butterfly, you can't go back. That's what is lovely about this you know, story. Like if you're transformed and you kill the paper and you're using a system, it's very hard to go back to and then figure out how to run your business with paper. And then the value driven, automation, decision making. So these are like five major changes and transformations happening in pharma. Okay, so I came here using an Uber. The first time I used an Uber was about 10 years ago. And because of it, it was in Rome in Italy. I caught my flight. It could have been like a multiple thousand dollars loss. No taxi was stopping in Rome. They were all full. And I realized that I heard about this company called Uber. I downloaded the app. I called the, the car. It was like five minutes later. I had a black car service. I made it to the air airport. And then Italians are like, you know, uh, you know, Mediterraneans. They can bend the rules. So you can talk to the right Italian guy. She can put you in front of the line. If you were in Germany, like you're staying in the back of the line and you're missing your flight. 
so by the way, I'm my, my background is I'm part Turkish, part Greek. I came to United States 20 years ago as a Turkish guy. Two years ago, 23 and me, I found out I'm half Greek. So but still both of them are Mediterranean, right? So I can relate to the Italian guys. So when I was thinking about that experience about my supply chain background and how I experienced Uber, I just like, it was like an Eureka moment for me. I just like, I found it. Uber is the perfect supply chain. What do you do as a supply chain guy? Right product, right quantity, right time, right quality, right price. If you can optimize for all of these dimensions, you have a perfect supply chain. I listed those dimensions next to Uber, pharma supply chain. Right product, make to order. You order a taxi, you get a taxi. Make to order versus make to stock. They're stocking a lot of products and they, get, they go expire. They lose millions of dollars every year to expire it because they just overproduced. Right quantity, the order size of one. You order a taxi, you get one taxi. You don't get two taxis, you don't get half a taxi, you get one taxi. You order in pharma, you need to order a very big batch size. Again, maybe half of the batch is gone to, you know, to garbage. You order something in Uber, if you're in New York City, it's one minute, two minutes maybe, because every corner there's an Uber driver. If you order something in pharma, it can take up to four months, five months, six months. Some cancer drugs take six months to produce. Like that's how much you wait. And then you need to rely on a forecast that is, which you, if you're lucky, if you, you know what to order for six months out, which you never know. Quality, the feedback, everybody's talking to each other, giving each other feedback. After a few years of Uber, I realized as a, as a passenger, I have a rating and it's not great. 4.7. Who is rating me? Like drivers are rating me. I wasn't tipping enough. So I started like improving my KPI, tipping more. And now I'm looking at my KPIs going up, up, up um, at the cost of tip, of course. The quality, like, is a very big problem. FDA keeps giving you know hundreds of warning letters every year to companies because they're not complying uh, well enough. And then the price, the, everybody complains in the US about high prices, right? You know, there's actually a thing called you know healthcare tourism. You go to other countries to get your you know stuff done you know, instead of staying here and, and doing it. So by the way, change pharma with any kind of industry, this applies, but pharma it's it's severe. If you want to take an example, take Uber as an example. Perfect supply chain. One digital platform, suppliers and, and customers, which is the passengers and drivers, are in the same platform. Everything is traceable. You can write algorithms. Algorithms make the decisions, right? How do you know the, the, the drivers uh, pick the passengers? The, the algorithm recommends. So if you want to imagine a perfect supply chain, imagine an Uber supply chain. So. One thing that I want to highlight here, like after years of uh, doing this work uh, in track and trace, I come up with a, a, a terminology, a transformation, a digital transformation terminology, a framework. We, we call it 3D, supply chain management 3D. And those 3Ds are data, dashboard, and decisions. So if you want to digitally transform something, you need to start with data. To collect the right, you need to have the data. Uber has the data at all times of everything that is moving. The ratings, the prices, the tips, like they have so much data that they can turn that data into dashboard, which means the insights. So what? Like nobody can read millions of records of databases. You need to turn it into a dashboard. You need to understand so what? The insights, the patterns. Once you understand those things, then you can make decisions with that insight and you make the better decisions. And you make the right decision, you get a better result as a business, right? But I also teach this framework at INSEAD in the executive education. You do your transformation forward, data dashboard decision, but you plan your transformation backwards. What outcomes that you want to improve? You want better profitability, you want less inventory, you want higher service level. What do you want? You need to know what you want. Then you make the decisions that impact those outcomes better. In order to make better decisions, you need to figure out which dashboards you should be looking at. What dashboard I should be looking at every day, so I always make the better decision. In order to look at that dashboard, what data you should be collecting. Like as a McKinsey consultant, I did projects that like six months long, first three months was collecting data. And we collected so much data in some of these projects, even if we don't need that data. They send us around to collect every data we can find, about 30 plus plants in a, 
in a consumer goods company. The project got delayed for three months because we just didn't have the data. So planning backwards, you only plan for the pieces of data that you need, and then you can collect that data, and you can get to the result right away. Have you heard of a term called data lake? I hate that term. Anybody likes data lakes? The data lake is basically companies invented this term who are like data companies or technology companies that they try to sell you is, hey, you can put a, you know, create a big data lake and put all your data in a data lake. Regardless of what data it is, put it all on the data lake and pay us $100 million while doing that. And then you can figure out all sorts of use cases for your business to improve. That's the wrong way to start your project. You can spend $100 million and you wouldn't even make a buck as a result. You start with the end in mind, you make the right decisions with the right dashboard, you collect only the right data. Then you maybe make, only spend one million in data collection, and then you get 100 million as, a, as an outcome for improved productivity or improved uh, revenues. So according to McKinsey, one of the reports about digitalization, they look at the revenue and EBITDA, the, the profitability and revenues of companies resulting from the digitalization efforts. And they look at where, for all possible departments. The digitalization of what department is resulting in the highest level of impact in revenue and EBITDA? And guess what department was that? Supply chain, yes. And guess which department was the least digitized? Department, not industry. Not industry, supply chain. Supply chain is found to be the most impactful on your end revenue and EBITDA goals, and yet it is the least digitized. So if you have $1 to invest in your company, where would you put it? Supply chain. So that's, to me, very exciting. So I'm going to show you this graph. I happen to see the story and then start using this graph. Uh, this is a graph about the front end of commerce. Like everybody, anybody who doesn't have an Amazon account, show me the hand and we're going to ridicule you and we're going to laugh at you. <sighs> Sorry. Really? What else? You don't do online shopping? Well, you do online shopping. Really? Okay. Like, you need to tell me how the world is with you because you're definitely a unique person. I can, I can speak with, like, no offense, I can speak with numbers. Up until the COVID, 16% of commerce was digital online shopping. During the COVID, that in 10 weeks, that number jumped to 34%. And right now, it's about 50%. Half of every dollar spent is online. It took 10 years to get to this level. It took 10 weeks to get to that level. The same amount of digitalization. So the front end commerce of commerce, where people buy their stuff, is already half digital, half you know, brick and mortar. Which, which company you use if it's not Amazon? Shopify? Demo. Oh, wow, okay, I know what you mean. It's like $5 stuff, right? So this is the front end of commerce. Back end of the commerce, which is where the stuff is made and shipped, the digitalization level, according to Gartner, is less than 5%. So commerce is one big economy, right? You cannot think about front end without the back end. It's like the software, like software with the front end and the back end. Commerce front end is the store, the back end is where the stuff is made. If the front end of the, the commerce is 50% digital and the back end of the commerce is 5% digital, don't you think there's a problem here? There's a huge problem here. So if some portion of the equation is already digital and the others is not supporting it, or they're supporting it with fax machines and paper and emails, then there's a ton of opportunity in here. By just being in this area, in factories, in manufacturing, in supply chain, you're going to experience 10x growth over the next five, 10 years. And that's where the opportunity is. And <clears throat> a lot of uh, technologies are emerging, like IoT. You know what this is? Internet of Things, sensors, manufacturing execution systems, enterprise resource planning, AI. I guess everybody heard AI. RPA, maybe you didn't hear this one, robotic process automation, like computer robots doing the job for you, and the cloud technologies. All these technologies will create so many new uh, solutions to the, the problem of 
you know, manufacturing and supply chain. We believe it's like lots of, lots of different unicorns will born and we are one of the candidates. Our goal in the next five years is to be a unicorn company because what we do in SDWAI is a combination of cloud solutions, IoT devices and uh, AI algorithms and, and really making a change for the manufacturers to catch up to the front end. So that's the story about um, supply chain and what is in the back end, what is in the front end. And that's why I think it's very, very exciting. So I have a question for you, and maybe a trick question, but what industry you think that is the most competitive? Marketing, okay, digital marketing. That's true, there's millions of companies out there. Airlines, yeah, that's also true because they don't make much money. They're stuck between back fees and delayed flights and new doors opening on Alaska Airlines. You know, if it's Boeing, I ain't going, right? You know, so yeah, I, I take 100 flights a year, so I, I know what you're talking about. What else? What industries, you know, Dr. Renu may say like, you know, education. There's so many universities out here, it's hard to compete for talents. Ads, marketing, digital marketing, yeah. Grocery, well, that's a difficult one for sure. By the way, you said digital ads. Anybody using Facebook here? Is it dead? One, two, I think it's dead. By statistics, we can decide that. <laughs> so this one is a trick question. The, the answer is sports. What do they do? They compete, that's their job. And I have three examples for you uh, here from sports. Anybody watch Moneyball? Anybody didn't watch Moneyball? Let me see the hands. Okay, oh, okay, this is, this is unique because I only had like one or two hands before. You guys are really hardworking students. You're not even watching you know, TV. Or maybe Netflix is not providing this one, right? So that's why. So your your homework, if I'm allowed to assign homework as a as a doctor, uh, is to watch Moneyball and really understand why a baseball team with such limited budget can rock the league with top performing team, and and then just understand the power of analytics and power of data. Amazing movie. Besides Brad Pitt, Microsoft and Real Madrid. Real Madrid is arguably the best soccer team in the world. Again, numbers prove it. And they partner with Microsoft to track every player on the field to understand how well they're running, how, how much they are running versus down, how much their like, heart rate is. All these statistics are being collected. If a coach is looking at 11 players on the field, coach is not seeing individual players. It's seeing, he's seeing the whole team. This allows the coach to track every single individual player and give personalized feedback. To the players. Hey Messi, you were like, you know, not well, Messi is in you know, Barcelona, I say. Cristiano Ronaldo, you weren't running as fast as last time. What's going on? You cannot measure it with your eyes. No human brain can compute that. So if they're all the top soccer team can think they can benefit from technology, put yourself in any industry. You're a company, you're the top of the, the industry, you're the best in, in a player in the industry. And you think you're the best and there's no more room for improvement? There's always room for improvement and technology is the answer. Formula One. Pit stops. Anybody knows how many seconds it used to take to do a pit stop in the 1950s? A guess? Yeah, it's 60 seconds plus. And there's actually all of these have videos behind them. I don't have the time, but 60 seconds of a pit stop is a torture to watch. You're watching your competitors like running by and then you're like twiddling your thumb and like, okay, come on, did you put the third tire as well? Yeah, did you fuel? Yeah, and like it's, it's, it's very painful. In 2020s, what is the average or what is the best pit stop timing? No. 1.8. You blink, you don't see the pit stop. And they're optimized the entire, you can consider this as a production line changeover. You're running a product and now you need to change it over to the next product. Imagine that takes like two seconds. 
they have 15 people or so working right now. Previously, they were like four or five because of the regulations. But four people times 60 seconds, that's 240 seconds workload. 15 times two, that's 30. That's 80% better. That happened over observations after observations and measurements and improvements. So if they can go from 60 to two in any pro in a process that is very difficult, complex, Imagine what kind of process improvements you guys can do in your companies when it's like manufacturing and supply chain. So that's the like, you know, I'm not even going to consumer goods. I'm going into sports to give those inspiration, but inspirations are everywhere. And it almost always include digital and technology and, and improvements uh, that comes with it. So I'm going to switch gears, the analogy into factory right now. Any questions on supply chain and what I told so far? Not yet? Anything that was like specifically interesting? You want to talk more? Well, we can do the Q&A on the vulnerabilities all day long, the risks, right? Uh, when the Suez Canal, you know, got stuck because one of the, the ships like stuck there, we didn't get product for weeks, right? Yeah, like having a single point of failure is a, is a big issue. I heard China is trying to do some kind of a canal, alternative to Panama Canal. Did you hear that? Like Panama Canal is designed so that it cuts down the, the timing. It, I'm going to Panama later this month as part of Georgia Tech Advisory Board, and I'm very interested in seeing how the canal works. But yeah, if you have one you know, failure point and if it fails, then everything is stuck. If you have one system, Kynet, if it fails, then things are down for sure. There are airlines that stopped for you know, a couple of days because their system went down. Yeah, so I mean, there, with every technology, every improvement comes with a little risk. But there are a lot of risk mitigation capabilities and, and things that you can do, like fail safes, alternatives, like different data centers, on-prem versus cloud. There's so much things to be done. And, and so far, it seems like the cloud world or the digital world is working fine. Except for an, you know, here and there, Facebook failures or, or Instagram not loading. Uh, I think the world is so far is, is doing a fine job. Any other questions? Yeah, it was uh, I, that that was very interesting to me in how you uh, brought improvement to those areas. Or Perfect. Yes, that's, that's the next section, and I have a lot of great topics to talk uh, cover about the, the manufacturing digitalization. Sorry, was there any other question as well? No. Okay, so. After spending a good amount of time and effort in supply chain topic, you know, I built this dream about end-to-end -end digital, fully autonomous supply chain. I call it self-driving supply chain. I think I, I don't know if I was the first one or one of the early ones, but I wrote an article called Self-Driving Supply Chain. It's on my LinkedIn profile in 2016. And I was inspired by the self-driving cars. If the cars can self-drive, which they're still not fully doing, I thought, you know, that's part of the supply chain, that's logistics. How about if manufacturing companies can self-drive? How about if the, uh, the warehouses are fully autonomous? You can build a wholly autonomous supply chain. That was the long-term vision. But then I realized it's a very big goal and it's not easy to achieve. So we focused our company's uh, focus into the, the manufacturing area and we just started developing the digital factory platform. And this is the, uh, an illustration of a digital factory platform. So, um, and it's like a mini supply chain, right? It's amazing, like how similar it is. Like there is like incoming goods, there's transport. There's a little warehouse in the in the factory that you hold your raw materials. There's actually processes and like parallel and serial processes. There are people working on, and then you try to you know get as much product as possible of the right product at the right price at the right time, right? Uh, so it's like a, literally a little mini supply chain. The complex issue, however, is like it's a multi-dimensional problem. 
it's not like, oh, make the machines run faster is not the, the answer for everything. First of all, you need to start with customer demands. Then optimize your production schedules. There are like a bunch of planners in here in this like nice comfortable room. They're not going to the, the floor. They organize the plan. And then there are people, the operators that are running the lines. So you need to optimize the productivity of the labor. That's another issue since COVID times. Like, you know, the average labor cost was what, you know, $10 before. Now it's like $15, $20. Manufacturers are not finding enough qualified workers for their plants. That's a challenge. And whoever comes in, they just, they just quit after three months, six months. It's a tough job. New generation. I don't know which letter we are right now, Gen Z or Alpha. My daughter is Alpha. You know, they went back to the, the beginning of the alphabet. Like they don't, they don't want to. They want to look at their iPads. They don't want to do the manufacturing jobs. So the labor productivity is a big, big problem. Efficiency improvement of the machinery is a big problem, right? That's what the, the five percent actual number comes from. The paper is a big problem. There's paper everywhere. And then ultimately, because you're so inefficient, the cost of the production is higher. And it, the end users, the consumers are paying for it. It's like a mini supply chain. But the challenge of the, the manufacturing is exactly the same as uh, supply chain challenges. And digital transformation is actually can be applied in a similar way. If you want to take away one thing, if you're going to go into the pharma, uh, you know, pharma industry or any industry for improving of the supply chain and manufacturing, take away this framework, data dashboard decision. 3D, very easy to remember. 3D, data dashboard decision. The problems that you see under data, lots of manual data collection, data collection on paper. The data that is on paper, you cannot see when you leave the site. The data that is not accurate, accuracy of the data, integrity of the data is questionable. Then you go into the dashboards or visibility. Lots of people are creating Excel spreadsheets and charts, and that take them seven days. And then you look at the chart, it's seven days old. You look backwards, like imagine driving your car, Formula One car with a backward you know, rear view mirror. You can't do that, right? You need to be looking forward. You need to be in real time. Yeah. Departments between, you know, within the same factory do not even talk to each other. Manufacturing, bulk manufacturing doesn't know what the packaging is doing, vice versa. They're just busy on their own uh, areas. And then, you know, this is one area that I learned a big time. I can pick a fresh new graduate with the right data skills and analytical skills over any 10, 20 year experienced managers. If you are the right smart person with the right skills, I'll hire you over a 20 year experience manager. Maybe the first six months, you're not gonna be a top performer. Maybe in your first year, you're gonna struggle. But once you get a handle on how the process works and how you can make better decisions, you can always beat a 20 year old guy. So that's why you guys are so lucky. Don't think that you're going in there, oh, I don't have experience. Well. I didn't have AI when I was graduating. You can use ChatGPT as you're like, I have written my VP of sales job description with ChatGPT. It took me three minutes. I asked ChatGPT, what are the requirements of a, a VP of sales? And what are the, uh, the things that we would uh, need from this person? Two questions, two answers. I copied, pasted, and make a few edits and publish, uh, publish in 50 applicants uh, in the first day. I would have waited my HR manager to write that for a week or two, and he did, you know, the previous HR manager, not this one, uh, and then it was so bad. Chat GPT was five times better. So using the data and you have the right experience, you're like, you're golden. So the vision for transformation is, we want to make the decision makers connect to the shop floor in, in, in real time by collecting data from every single operating unit with sensors, with tablets, consolidate and structure the data, visualize the data on dashboard in real time or historical, and then analyze the data and making it ready for decision making. You know how many decisions are made in, in a given day in a manufacturing site? Like unlimited. Like, give me an exact. Okay. Have you ever worked in a manufacturing plant? Maybe as internship, anyone? Maybe the faculty, yeah? You haven't. I bet you're gonna find at least a few really good decisions. Give me an example of a daily decision in a plant. Somebody needs to make a decision every day. Give me an example. 
what to make, right? Quality control to whether to release the product or not. That's a decision. Yep. What else? Maintenance of the equipment. Which main, which equipment to maintain? Where to start first? Exactly. What else? Staffing. Yep. Hiring, firing, right sizing, training, daily, weekly decisions. What else? Give me something that you might be like making monthly decisions. Inventory. What should be our inventory targets? And related to that, what should be our production plan? Monthly decision, exactly. What else? And you guys didn't even work in manufacturing. How do you know all this? Yeah, some clients have 20 of these packaging lines. They can only run 10 of them at any given time because they don't have the team to run. If you don't have the labor, then you need to plan which 10 of those equipment you should run. That's a difficult quest decision, right? How do you know where do you, whether you run one through 10 or one, three, five, seven? How do you know which lines to run? How do you know which product to produce? How do you know how much to produce? How do you know what to release, what not to release? These are all decisions. And with data, those decisions are easier. And companies are struggling big time because they don't know what to produce. They just produce the same thing this week. Okay, well, let's go for a week and produce the same widget. And then the warehouse is full up to brim, and then the other product is stocking out because you didn't produce it enough. I had a, a story like a, a warehouse uh, you know, procurement person was basically like you know uh, ordering more than needed, and the warehouse was full. They were starting to basically park the, the pallets outside in the yard under the rain. There's like no space left in the warehouse. And when you ask the person, like, why are you, like, how are you ordering? How are you deciding what to order? And she says, I always order more than the required amount just to make sure that nobody yells at me. Because they once yelled at her, or maybe twice, because they were, like, running out of inventory. So she changed the behavior. She's just ordering more than necessary. She's not even looking at the yard. She's in, his, in her desk, like, just, you know, order more, order more, order more. And then there's all these expiry, expired products, product gone bad. So the problem of data collection turning into decisions is, is real. But then what is more also on top of it is like, how do you bring the right data to the right person at the right time to make the right decision? So if you're the site head, right, Andrew, right? If you're the site head and if I keep coming, you, hey, this machine is down. Five minutes later, Andrew, this machine is down. Andrew, the other machine is down. What would you do with that information? It's not your, but you're not the right person. Maintenance person would be the right person. The maintenance would be like, oh, okay, let me send a crew member to go fix it. So site head wouldn't need a, a downtime every 15 minutes, every five minutes. A maintenance person would need it. What site head might need is like how much to produce that month whether we are on track versus the, the actual. So bringing the right data at the right time to the right person is key in how you make digital transformation happen. And we worked on a lot of mobile apps and alerts and smartwatch, like, hey, you know, the watch tells you what happened, if it's relevant for you. And therefore, you create this end-to-end -end visibility within the factory so you can understand how is your shift going, your daily reports are coming out automatically, your weekly reports are automatically generated, nobody spends time on it. You understand your labor hours, whether they're doing overtime or regular time. You have digitized forms, so you don't need to go search for the archive room. You know there's something called an archive room in the plants, and people pay other companies to, to maintain those archive rooms in a temperature controlled setting, especially in pharma, for 11 years. Did you know that tens of thousands of dollars every month paid to an archiving company, which can be in your iPad? Like that's the world we live in, and you guys will have plenty of opportunities to go attack in your in your jobs, whatever your jobs would be. And then one more technology maybe I can highlight is this called thing called IoT, Internet of Things. Getting the things in the physical world connected to the things in the, the cyber world. How do you collect data? What is the status of this equipment? You put one of these sensors, which by the way, supply chain wizard team designed, developed, created the circuit board and, and manufactured these sensors. Now we have these sensors from like, you know, Portland, Oregon to Auckland, New Zealand. 
21 hour time zone. Like we have these babies everywhere collecting data about production counts, about the vibration of the machines, energy consumption of that machine, whether the temperature and humidity are within range, whether somebody you know, with labor or asset like checked in to the room because they have their RFID card, they buzz in and they buzz out. So it, these type of technologies now allow you to track everything, almost everything in real time. So if you ask me like, hey, how are you collecting all this data? Because data collection is a, is a massive amount of work. It used to be, people used to do it on paper. That's why there's interns. You, you hire an intern, you send them to the, uh, the line, and intern all day long fill out a form. Anybody did motion and time study who's an industrial engineer? Yeah, that's what we did when we were growing up. Motion study, time study. Every time something happens, you just check mark, check mark, check mark, okay. And all day long, you're just like, you know, crossing on the paper. Now sensors are doing it like at a fraction of a penny uh, for the data collection. So to long story short, after running supply chain wizard for 10 years, in the background, I was running the software company, but we never called it a software company. Two years ago, we created a CW AI to be a standalone company. And this is all the technology that we either developed and implemented or are still currently developing to make the entire manufacturing fully digital. Vision, self-driving factory. Lights out manufacturing, that's the other way. Like, there's nobody really, everything is automated. We're very, you know, few you know, miles away from achieving that, but there are companies who achieved it. I've seen it with my own eyes 17 years ago at Intel in Arizona, when I was an intern, you know, during my PhD program, they took me to a fabrication facility in Arizona to show me the shop floor. You need to gown and then a double gown. It's more cleaner than a, an operating room in a, in a hospital. And then I walked in, you know, excited industrial engineer with a you know, PhD candidate. I want to see how the, the chips are made. Like, I don't even know. I have no clue how the chips are made. Walk in, I don't see anybody. But where is the production? And my supervisor said, look up. There are monorail systems up in the ceiling. They were literally like running around like a Star, star Trek. Things were going up in the air, bay by bay. These things were shuttle, shuttles were sent down. The machines are taking in, processing, taking it back out, and then it goes in. There was not a single operator on the floor. Self-driving manufacturing is reality. It's already happening in semiconductor industry. Pharma will take a few more decades, but we are building the tools to get there. How are the steps working out? Step one, visibility and productivity. You need to know everything about everything. I mean, if you're a control freak, you should know more than everything. But if you're a sighted, you should definitely know everything. Like how many people you have? Are they utilized or not? How many machines do you have? Are they running or not? Do, they, do you use enough energy? Are you, is your energy bill increasing? If you rely on paper to report on these monthly, then you will never get out of those like problems. Visibility and productivity. Step two, kill the paper. Paper doesn't belong. First of all, it's not good for the environment anyway. Why are we cutting trees for paper in 2024? Third step, planning and scheduling. If you let this procurement lady decide the story that I told and keep ordering more than necessary, you're never going to be doing a good enough planning to run the facility in a, in a nice way. Uh, one of the biggest problem is like producing, keeping the plant utilized, so you look at the visibility and productivity, it's 80% utilization, it's a really good plan. But the planning's job is to make sure you produce the right product, not any product. If you're producing the wrong product at 80% efficiency, you're creating inventory that you don't need. Planning and scheduling. Once you get the basics right, execution, paperless factory, and the planning, then you are ready for your advanced analytics. So don't get too excited about AI if you don't have the basics right. If you don't have the AI, why do you think ChatGPT is not trustworthy? Exactly, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, I'm not trying to belittle the technology. The technology is amazing, but if the internet is full of garbage and you're asking ChatGPT to give you a summary of the garbage, you're gonna get a summary of the garbage. If you have those things in place and good quality data flowing, now you can do so much good stuff with AI. Anomaly detection. Is something wrong with my plant? Site has, a, has no, no clue. 
AI can monitor all the data and then tell you something is wrong with your plant. And normally it takes optimizing the production schedules with algorithms. AI can decide the optimum algorithm for you based on your changing demand and supply situation. And then sustainability is the last step, which is basically how do we run a plant that doesn't create too much carbon footprint? How do we run our operations where our data, the master data is always up to date, et cetera. Uh, so that's a five step process. And uh, maybe just to wrap up on maybe the AI topic, because that's such an important topic. Uh, we are a Microsoft partner. Uh, do we have a few more minutes to finish? Yeah, a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, nobody wants to be an entrepreneur. That's why I'm spending all my time in the supply chain and manufacturing. You find me afterwards so if you want to start your own company. Um, we have a partnership with Microsoft and ChatGPT was like the hottest technology ever. Uh, I think that this technology reached more users than any other technology in the history in shortest amount of time. And we did a, a pilot project together. So we basically take operator input, free text input, and we classify that. Um, summarization and classification of the, the free text into categories automatically with AI. That's one example. And then another example, which is a favorite of mine, is using com uh, computer vision, the camera, the webcam, you place on the line. This is a packaging line, and there's a lot of light towers in the packaging line, and the light towers are blinking random lights, green, yellow, blue, you don't even know what they are for, nobody knows unless you ask the engineer who installed the machine. There's so many of these. And then you monitor these uh, signals, right? These are the light towers. And you use a technology called machine learning. You probably also heard that. You probably have seen such uh, graphics, right? Okay, the machine learning looks into this and says it's a dog. It can be tricked, by the way. The cookies can look like dogs. Dogs can look like cookies. You've seen that picture? The bicycle, the car. The self-driving thing is all recognizing all these objects. But the objects in the shop floor, there is no data for it. Nobody had enough data for it. So what we did is we took this already optimized algorithm. We transferred the learning of that to another machine learning algorithm and, and educated and trained the model a little bit further so that it recognizes the, the combinations of lights and what it means. And when you put this in a, in a camera and all these machinery is like light towers are seen and the, this is a time series data, they are like blinking reds, yellow, greens, blues, whatever the combination, you collect data in a structured way. You use camera to collect data basically, not an intern. Intern will never keep up with the blinking light. How many times it blinked? I missed the document, sorry. Yeah. This is a camera collecting data for you with AI. This is another one form of data that is vibration data. This is a vibration sensor, a sensor that we created with all the vibration. Unless you turn into a frequency analysis, you cannot understand what is wrong in this picture. So that's analytics built on the data collection. That's the vibration on top of the camera. And then you can add other data channels, vibration, energy consumption, operator input. Everything that generates data is a data channel. You're creating data channels, data channels, data channels. Once you feed that very nicely organized, clean data to an AI deep learning machine, uh, machine learning algorithm, then you can get a prediction from the AI and say, the machine is running, machine is down, machine is in clean up state, machine is in failure, this particular machine has failed. So this is basically a predictive model that basically does a job of an entire software. If we can achieve this, we kick ourselves out of the market and this will be our replacing us as the, the new software company. That's why AI is dangerous dangerously good. If somebody, some smart dude that figures this out before we do, then we'll be like, we are a new startup, we'll be out to market, the new AI guy will come in and say, hey, I did this with a camera. It takes like you know, pennies to install these cameras and a cloud solution provider. And at the end of the day, this is a, you know, there's a uh, video, let me see if we could choose. This even works, oh, there you go. Oh, they embedded the video into my slide, that's great. So. So, I mean, this is so simple from like recognizing what, what is the likelihood this is blue, this is green. I mean, this is also difficult and simple at the same time. Simple because there's already algorithms developed for it. And then based on these combinations, the prediction is, you know, going on. So it's right, runtime commercial. We are running production right now. No person, no iPad, no sensor, nothing. It's just a camera. It's just amazing. And once that happens, 
you can replace a lot of workload and you get more precise data at the fraction of the cost. And now you're transforming the supply chain and the manufacturing, right? So just to wrap up today, uh, we have a case study. If you all linked in me after this show, this is the, the effort that we were putting in earlier in the year. And we just had this uh, video that is released today. This is a, oh, it clicked on. I'm not going to show you the everything, but this is a client of ours in advanced materials. And they did. They did transform their factory over two years and significant improvement in efficiency. And let me just fast forward some of these things. Yeah, so looking at your data understanding what they are doing with their operations, finding opportunities to improve, making better decision making, being notified when things are wrong. These are all basic technologies, but when you put them together as a, like an operating system, then their efficiency went through the roof over the last two, three years, and they just agreed to create a success story for us. And this is just released today, so I'm actually sharing with you for the first time a proud moment. Uh, this is our very first video success story. Like other clients were either in different places or they're not, they didn't agree yet. Um, and even the operators, like, you know, one of the things that this is a supervisor guy. This site is in Istanbul in, in Turkey. Here's like a performance board, the whiteboard that they normally use. And this guy is saying, like, this is the first thing we look at every morning. I go to the factory, I'm looking at this first thing in the morning. I understand what went wrong yesterday, and we are basically logging our activities in the system and now you're figuring out what to do and then you do better and better and better every day you not only enable a machine learning but you also enable a, a human learning you're just becoming a better performer better operator better supervisor so with that i'm run out i run out of time thank you very much Evren, there was a question from chat, but I asked uh, uh, him to, uh, I, I told him that you'll contact him offline because we're running a little late. Yeah, so my contact information, uh, I always enjoy sharing stories and giving guidance and, you know, uh, happy to help. If anyone wants to start uh, a, a company in the future, I can be the first one to tell you, think twice. But I think you all should start a company at some point in your career uh, just to try it, just to fail a few times. You never know. You know, it looks like all these things happen like all perfect order and like great story, but there's so many failures built into the story. So don't please take it away like, oh, okay, well, this guy was super lucky and all these things went his way. And, and no. In COVID time, we were almost bankrupting because our, our sales went down 65%. Uh, while software was going up. So hedging the bet on software versus consulting was the one that saved us, basically. Okay, I'll be here for a few more moments uh, for additional questions. Yeah, don't leave, don't leave anybody, oh. please. Yeah. Don't leave. Uh, students, um, uh, if you have not, uh, if you don't, haven't had your attendance recorded, just make sure you uh, record it. Uh, um, Annie will uh, record this for you or uh, Amelia over there. Um, so thank you, Erin. This was terrific. We could have listened to you for hours and hours. I can't talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, as Erin said, if any of you want to chat with him, he'll be more than happy to do so. At the right uh, price. At the right price. <laughs> at the right price. Um, I want to thank all of our faculty members and, and members of the administration that came here. Our deans couldn't be here because they were at a recruiting event at the Intrepid in New York. Uh, so um, the other thing is, and I also want to thank all of you for coming here. I'm sure all of you found it really informative. I did. Um, so there are some snacks for you outside uh, to uh, there are some snacks for you outside. You can uh, snack and chat. Yeah. You know? um, the other thing is, let me see if I have. Any. And of course, thanks to my amazing ASCM uh, student chapter board. They work together so well. They always have. 
four of them are graduating uh, this semester. I'm going to miss them so much. And I tell them, you know, what's so good about working, right? I mean, what's so good about them working? Stay here for another year. <laughs> but anyway, um, but Evren, there is a small yeah. token of our beach. Thank you very much. A beach bag. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Nice colors, Greek blue. So that's my other. Can you hear me? Try to get. Uh, you know we have a big game today. So this is a close game. What? Close. Volume. Yes. <laughs> we have a big basketball game today. So Anne is going to see if she can um, project it here uh, on our screen. So if you want to hang around and watch it with us. Talk to Evren. Oh, yeah. Making night out of it. Unfortunately, the Dr. Sung's uh, class has to go back. <laughs> and, uh, it it okay. <laughs> <laughs> he brought his class here. Yeah, so we're not going back to class. This is the class. <laughs> 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 